Good morning. Good morning. My name is Erica Deneve, and I will be your service leader this morning. Thank you so much for joining us in person and online and sharing in community and communion with us, especially in these troubled times. We would like to have some time for quiet and reflection to begin with. And so we'd like to prepare for ourselves and the service with a prelude. That was lovely, Karen, thank you. So I have not been in person in the church for a while, and um, I am likely going to blow the order of things um, um, out a bit, bit, and that will just be what it is. (laughs) Um, So I should have done some greetings and announcements. Um, We do have a couple of announcements that are rather important before we get to official welcoming of everyone. Um, The first of which is, as I'm sure you are all aware, uh, as of Tuesday, uh, the province has decided that COVID's no longer a thing. Uh, (laughs) And while we may have personal opinions about that, um, masking is no longer going to be officially required. However, the church would like to remind everyone that everyone's personal opinions about that are going to vary. And as much as we will all, I'm sure, love the idea of being closer to each other and hugging and having uh, more intimate conversations and that sort of thing, please check in with the people that you are uh, doing that with beforehand, uh, just to take note of their comfort levels as we are interacting in the church and just make sure that they are okay um, so that we can just be respectful of everybody's needs. Also, tonight uh, there is going to be a vigil at the church. Um, I'm sure you're also aware of everything that has been happening in uh, the Ukraine um, and other places in the world, unfortunately. There has also been bombing in Syria, Somalia, and Yemen uh, that started at the same time as Russia's attacks on the Ukraine. 
And so our candlelit vigil this evening will be for all people who are currently suffering the effects of war and, uh, and in support of those peoples. So that vigil tonight will be at 7 p.m. and it will be available here and online for those of you who can't make it in person. Um, we try to have things online still as much as possible and that will continue. Um, so if anyone else has any other announcements at this time, I believe Art, you had something that you wanted to share? Good morning. Uh, yes, along the same lines as uh, Erica has indicated, the world events uh, are rather troubling. And uh, on a personal note, of course, the Ukrainian situation where uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. And uh, this uh, is where I was born. That's where uh, I come from, and uh, therefore it's a little bit more personal. Uh, this afternoon, I'm told, uh, there will be a, a rally starting at the Grant McEwen uh, uh, University campus and going to the legislative building and uh, everybody, everybody is invited to join at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Um, and just so you know, the link for the vigil tonight, if you're not coming in person to the church, is the same as the regular Zoom link for the church services. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Well, in that case, I would like to formally welcome you to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. As I said, my name is Erica Deneve, and the Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today both online and in person. We respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Anishabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We recognize that everyone here has a role to play to help build this community. We can do so by cherishing old friendships and opening our circle to include newcomers. We give thanks to those who work on behalf of this community every day. We acknowledge our volunteers who help make this service run so smoothly. Thank you, you're amazing. <laughs> And we ask now, you take a moment to ensure all of your devices that are not currently helping with that are silenced. And for those who are hearing impaired, our ushers have audio devices available for you. It used to be our practice to stay after, and we're going to get back to that soon, I promise. Now, for our chalice lighting, Maria. Maria is going to come and help me for lighting the chalice. We gather into this circle. We gather into this circle of care to dream, to envision, to embody and achieve the compassion we dream, the justice we envision, 
the dignity of each in an ever-growing circle of love and justice. Our first hymn this morning is number 360, Here We Have Gathered. Please stand as you are willing and able, and please join us online if you can to sing with us. And Karen's going to, Karen Mills is going to read the story for us this morning, The Name Jar, and I'll let you say the, compose, the author's name because I can't say it off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> Lin Suk Choi. All right. This is so awesome. I love reading stories. <laughs> Through the school bus window, Yoon Hai looked out at the strange buildings and houses on the way to her new school. It was her first day, and she was both nervous and excited. She fingered the little block of wood in her pocket and remembered leaving her grandmother at the airport in Korea. Her grandmother had wiped away Yoon Hai's tears and handed her an ink pad and a small red satin pouch. Your name is inside, she said. My name, Yoon Hai wondered. Again, she took out the red pouch and looked at the wooden block with her name carved in it. As she ran her fingers along the grooves and ridges of the Korean characters, she pictured her grandmother's smile. that thing for show and tell? A boy asked Yoon Hee, surprising her. No, it's mine, she quickly answered, putting it back in her pocket. Are you new here? What's your name? And the, the girl asked. Yoon Hai, she said. Oon The girl asked, scrunching up her face. Ooh, ooh, oon said another girl. No, no, Yoon Hai corrected her. It's spelled U-N-H-E-I, and it's pronounced Yoon Hai. Oh, it's Yu Hei, said a boy like, hey, you. What about we just call you hey, you? Just then the bus pulled up to the school and the doors opened. Yoon Hai hurried to get off. Hey, you, bye-bye, the kids yelled. 
Yoon Hai felt herself blush. Yoon Hai stood in the doorway of her new and noisy classroom, and she was relieved when the kids on the bus had gone to other rooms, but her face still felt red. Aren't you going in? asked a curly-haired boy with lots of dots on his face. You're the new girl, right? he asked cheerfully. Yoon Hai nodded, and before she could walk away, the boy took her hand and pulled her through the door. Here's the new girl, he announced proudly, and so loudly that Mr. Cockatoos, the teacher, almost dropped his glasses. Mr. Cockatoos thanked him and greeted Yoon Hai. Please welcome our new student, he said to the class. She and her family just arrived from Korea last week. Yoon Hai smiled broadly and tried to hide her nervousness. What's your name? Someone shouted. Yoon Hai pictured the kids on the bus. Um, I haven't picked one yet, she told the class, but I'll, I'll let you know by next week. As Mr. Cockatoo showed her around the, to her desk, she felt many round, curious eyes on her. Why doesn't she have a name? She heard someone whisper. Maybe she robbed a bank in Korea and needs a new identity. <laughs> On the bus home, nobody teased her, but Yoon Hai kept thinking about her name. How was school, Yoon Hai? Her mother asked when she walked in. Did you understand the teacher? Yoon Hai simply nodded. She unpacked her school bag and set the red pouch by the photograph of her grandma. I'm glad you're learning English well, her mother said. You must study hard, behave nicely, and get good grades to show that you are a good Korean. I will, replied Yoon Hai, but, but I think I would like my own American name, she said quickly. Her mother looked at her with surprise. Why? Yoon Hai is a beautiful name. Your grandma and I went to a name master for it. But it's so hard to pronounce, Yoon Hai complained. I don't want to be different from all the American kids. You are different, Yoon Hai, her mother said. And that's a good thing. Yoon Hai just wrinkled her nose. Later that day, Yoon Hai and her mother went grocery shopping in their new neighborhood. They passed Fadil's Falafel, Tony's Pizza, and Dot's Deli. A big graffiti-painted garbage truck roared like a lion as it took off down the street. Nothing sounded or looked familiar until they got to Kim's Market. The sign was in both English and Korean. And her mother picked up cabbage to make kimchi, a Korean-style spicy pickled cabbage, and other vegetables and meat. And she also found some seaweed, Yoon Hai's favorite, for soup. And that made Yoon Hai smile. Just because we're moving to America, her mother said, doesn't mean we stop eating Korean foods. At the checkout counter, a friendly man smiled at Yoon Hai. Helping your mother with shopping, he said. Yoon Hai nodded. I'm Mr. Kim. What's your name? Yoon Hai, she answered. Ah, oh, what a beautiful name, he said. Doesn't it mean grace? Yoon Hai nodded again. My mother and grandmother went to a name master for it, she told him. A graceful name for a graceful girl, Mr. Kim said as he put their groceries into a bag. Welcome to the neighborhood, Yoon Hai. That evening, Yoon Hai stood in front of the bathroom mirror. Hi, my name is Amanda, she said cheerfully. Then she wrinkled her nose. Hi, my name is Laura. Maybe not. Nothing sounded right. Nothing felt right. I don't think American kids will like me, she worried as she began to brush her teeth. Hi, my name is Shuji, she said in the mirror with her mouth full of toothpaste. The next morning when Yoon Hai arrived at school, she found a glass jar on her desk with some pieces of paper in it. Yoon Hai took out one and read it aloud. Daisy. That's my baby sister's nickname, but she said you can use it if you want, said Cindy, who sat next to her. You and I took out the rest of the paper. Tamala, she read. I got it from a storybook, said Nate. She was smart and brave. Yunhai nodded and unfolded another piece of paper. 
Wednesday? Yeah, you came here on a Wednesday, said Ralph. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your help. A smile spread over Yoon Hai's face. Ralph quickly said, we'll put more names in. You can pick whatever you like or pick them all and you'll have the longest name in history. <laughs> At three o'clock, the bell rang for the end of the school day. Yoon Hai looked out the window and saw it was sprinkling. It's the same rain, she thought, but in a different place. She watched other kids leaving in groups. Hey, a familiar voice called out to her. Yoon Hai took turned around to see the curly-haired boy again. I'm Joey, he said. And you? Don't you have any name? Yoon Hai thought for a moment. Well, I can show you, she said, and took out the small red pouch. She pressed the wooden block on the ink pad and then stamped it on a piece of paper. This is my name stamp, she said. My grandma gave it to me. In Korea, I can use it as a signature when I open a bank account or write a letter. And whenever I miss my grandma, I use it to fill a piece of paper. Want to try it? She offered the stamp to Joey, and he carefully inked it and stamped the paper. And the red characters gleamed against the whiteness. Wow, that's beautiful, said Joey. Can I keep the paper? Sure, said Yoon Hai. And then the two of them shared her umbrella as they ran to the bus. Every day, the jar got fuller with names, and Yoon Hai read them all. She found a few she liked, Miranda, Stella, Avery. They sounded interesting. I hope you choose the name I put in, Marco told her at snack time. I've put in three more, said Ralph. Madison, Park, and Lex. They're my favorite streets. Maybe you should close your eyes and draw a name, Rosie suggested. Ralph frowned. That's silly. What if she doesn't like the name she draws? Well, we didn't get to choose our names, did we? Everyone thought about that. When Yoon Hai got home from school that day, her little brother ran to her to give her a letter. It was from her grandma. She opened it quickly and it said, To my Yoon Hai, I hope you are enjoying your new school and new friends. Be sure to help your mother and your little brother. Here, the moon is up, but there, the sun is up. No matter how far apart we are, and no matter how different America is from Korea, you'll always be my Yoon Hai, your grandma forever. Yoon Hai took out her wooden stamp and filled a paper with it. She thought for a long time in front of the bathroom mirror. On Saturday, Yoon Hai walked to Mr. Kim's store. Mr. Kim was helping a customer, but he looked up and greeted her. Hi, Yoon Hai. Hello, Mr. Kim, Yoon Hai replied. She felt as if she was back in her old neighborhood in Korea. Hey, the customer said, turning around. It was Joey. Your name is Un Hee? He asked with his eyes open wide. Yoon Hai looked quickly at Mr. Kim, then turned to Joey. She nodded smiley, or slowly, and said, yes, it, it's pronounced Yoon Hai, and it means grace, Mr. Kim added. Yoon Hai, Joey said slowly, and this time perfectly. It made Yoon Hai smile. I'll have it ready for you tomorrow, said Mr. Kim to Joey. Thanks, Mr. Kim. See you on Monday, Yoon Hai. Joey said to her, and he left before she could ask him what he was actually doing in the store. On Monday, Yoon Hai came to class to look at the names one last time, but the jar wasn't on her desk. Instead, there was just a single piece of paper, paper with her name on it. Yoon Hai slipped it in her pocket. Where's your name jar? asked Ralph as soon as he saw it was gone. I don't know, said Yoon Hai. It wasn't on Mr. Kakatos' desk or on any other desk, and it wasn't on the counters or any of the shelves. As the other kids arrived, they helped look. Soon Mr. Kakatos came in, and Ralph shouted at him, The name jar is gone! The jar with all the names in it! Gone, Mr. Kakatos replied. With a look of concern, he asked Yoon Hai, Did you get a chance to read all the names? She nodded. She took a breath. I'm ready to introduce myself, she said. 
Yoon Hai wrote her name in both English and Korean on the chalkboard. I liked the beautiful and funny names you thought for me, but I realized that I liked my name best, so I chose it again. Korean names mean something. Yoon Hai means grace. Grace, grace in high, shouted Ralph. Everyone tried to say it. Yin Hai, Un Hai. Un Hai heard her name again, and slowly and clearly she said it. Soon the kids began to say it better, even Mr. Cockatoes. They applauded Yun Hai's choice. I was named after a flower, Rose said. Lots of American names have meaning too, Mr. Cockatoes reminded everyone. When the class was dismissed, Yun Hai heard her new friend say goodbye. Bye, Yun Hai. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, Yun Hai. Yun Hai said goodbye and then looked around for Joey, but he was already gone. Yun Hai, Yun Hai, come downstairs, mother called up. Your friend is here. Yun Hai rushed down to see who she meant. There stood Joey, and in his arms was the name jar. Where did you find it? Yun Hai said breathlessly. Joey looked embarrassed. Well, um, I took it. But only because I wanted you to keep your own name. And you did. He reached out in and pulled the names out. Do you want to keep them? Thank you. I'll keep them as a souvenir, Yun Hai said happily. Then she pulled out the piece of paper from her pocket. Do you want this back? Joey grinned. You can keep it. I'll return the name jar to the class. Maybe you could put in some Korean nicknames for us, names with good meanings. I could do that, said Yun Hai. I've already got a Korean nickname, Joey said. Mr. Kim helped me choose it. Carefully, he pulled out a small silver pouch from his pocket. Then he took out a dark wooden stamp with beautiful Korean characters carved sharply into it. He pressed it on the ink pad and then onto a piece of paper next to her name. Chin Ku, read Yun Hei. That means friend. And Chin Ku smiled back. I'd invite you now to join in singing our hymn of the month, Love the Sacred Creed. Thank you, Thank you so much, Karen. I love that story. Fine, don't worry. <laughs> it's all good, don't worry. <laughs> we um, are now come to the time where we are going to share our abundance. And 
Our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. In addition to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Some are local, some national, some international. For the month of February, yeah, we're in February, <laughs> we are sharing our abundance with iHuman. This is a local organization um, founded on the belief that all young people deserve care and support. They support youth between the ages of 12 and 24 to navigate complex systems such as housing, transportation, mental health, justice, financial assistance, and medical care. They've helped hundreds of youth beat the odds and become contributing members to our society because all young people have gifts to share that make our future more vibrant. So you're invited to participate in the celebration of giving um, we're not doing the usher thing anymore. I'm not exactly sure how this works now, but I know you all do. So plates are on either side um, of, and by the exit as well. There you go. This is all so new and weird. And you know what? We're going to get back to things being sort of normal at some point. And we just navigate it as we can. And it's okay that it feels weird and all of it is a work in progress. That's okay. We'll get through it all together. So we will now sing <laughs> our song for sharing our abundance from you I receive. Sunday, we light candles with our joys and concerns imbued from our bodies. We light a candle and then we, and, uh, we let it flame throughout the service. And this symbolizes the things that we're holding inside of us. It could be something joyful. It could be something concerning to us. It could be something around world events that are happening. And each Sunday, we either light some candles or we drop a pebble to signify this. So if there is something on your heart, on your mind at this time that you would like to light a candle for, I invite you to line up on that side. Take a taper, come and light it, light a candle, and then douse it in the water and put your expired taper in that basket. There's all familiar faces, I think, here, fairly, fairly familiar faces. I think I've met most of you, so you probably know what to do by now. So I invite you now to light candles of joy and or concern.
thank you. I know we have a lot on our hearts right now. So we will continue with those things on our heart, with Erica lighting one last candle to, for us to hold all the things. Not spoken candles held in our hearts and minds. And we continue on with our meditation time. I'm going to read Eagle Poem by Joy Harjo. I'm going to read it a couple of times. And then we're going to sing our meditation hymn hymn number 1053, How Could Anyone Ever Tell You? So you can have it open, or I am quite certain the words will pop up on the screen, whichever is your choice. And to prepare for this time of meditation, I invite you to breathe with me and to center yourself Allow that life-giving air to fill up your lungs and then to release it as you no longer need. Feel the chair supporting you, the floor, the bed, the couch, whatever it is that you are leaning into. Just to take a couple more deep cleansing breaths and draw your attention into your being there are points of tension or ickiness and breathe into those. Eagle Poem by Joy Harjo. To pray you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you and know there is more more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know except in moments steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circled in blue sky, in wind, swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you. We see ourselves and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe, knowing that we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true circle of motion like eagle rounding out the morning inside us. We pray that it will be done in beauty. In beauty. To pray, you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more that you cannot see, can't hear, can't know except in moments steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circled in blue sky in wind, swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you, see ourselves, and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe, knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true circle of motion. 
like eagle, rounding out the morning inside us. We pray that it will be done in beauty. In beauty. Now let us sing our meditation hymn, How Could Anyone? Ask Karen to bring, the, bring us into that. We'll sing it through a couple of times. And you are beautiful. Let's look around. Aren't we beautiful? Look around on gallery view. If you can, you might not be allowed. I'm not just too sure. But we are so beautiful. We are a community. We love one another. And we cherish being together. Now I'm going to wreck it all with a sermon. So we're talking this morning about widening the circle, and it's the, commi the UUA Commission on Institutional Change. And so some of it's fairly, the whole, um, the Commission on Institutional Change came together around 2018 and put this work out, and uh, I'll be talking about it in different ways this morning. But first, I'd like to read a section from one of the people on the commission, um, and she is a, um, a, a white person. Her name is Mary Byron, and this is what she has to say. Mary starts with a quote from the commission, the guiding principle. To keep Unitarian Universalism alive, we must privilege the voices that have been silenced or drowned out by dis and dismantle elitist and exclusionary white privilege, which inhibits connection and creativity. Mary continues, my UU faith has been an important part of the spiritual journey of my life. I believe our principles and our way of expressing them publicly, advocating for the world of justice, equity, and compassion, we know is possible. And we know this world is not yet here, which calls us into doing the work that is needed to create it. This is one part of why I do anti-racism work, she says. It may be a simple statement to say, my faith calls me into action, and it is sometimes not so easy to live. As a white person, I have needed to do a lot of deep spiritual work on myself, unlearning the ideas of supremacy that I have absorbed from our culture 
is so much harder than learning about injustice, yet I know we won't move away from our comfort in white supremacy until we unlearn and dismantle it in our lives. Arundhati Roy said, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing because as political an act as speaking out, there's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. She continues, when I moved past claiming my innocence in building these systems and denying their racist intent to see them, really see how they operate, I couldn't unsee the justice. It is in the news every day, everywhere. Keeping quiet, doing nothing isn't an option for me in a faith that proclaims that we respect the inherent worth and dignity of all people. There is no dignity in economic, housing, justice, immigration, environmental, and educational systems that create such inequal, inequitable outcomes. White people built these, and white people are required to demand, dismantle these unjust, inequitable, and cruel systems to completely transform them. I knew I couldn't do this transformational work unless I was willing to get uncomfortable, which I'm sure most of you are by now. To start by acknowledging my role in our systems and the ways I participate in upholding our dominant white culture. Conflict avoidance, assuming that good intentions are enough, denial, tokenism. It's hard to see these things in myself, but I need to see it and change it in order to live into the principles I believe. This is part of my spiritual practice. I practice humility and forgiveness for myself and my community as a spiritual work when we engage in dismantling these systems. I recognize I am going to make mistakes, and I also know how I will acknowledge them and try to repair the harm. I try not to let fear stop me and to stay curious about when and where my discomfort arises. Every time I make a new discovery about my thinking that releases limiting thoughts and behaviors, I feel more free. And that is also spiritual work. I also do this work because I find such joy in the community of people engaged here. The guiding principle above speaks to how white supremacy culture inhibits connection and creativity breaking down my personal barriers and connecting with people is liberation for my heart. My joy comes from belonging to a community with big-hearted, creative, wel welcoming people, working with people of imagination and with a willingness to come together to build a more just and generous faith community learning from the variety of lived experiences and perspectives of people in different communities and congregation enlarges my dreams of what is possible and grounds them in what is necessary. Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore speaks of dreaming of a Unitarian universalism that does not yet exist. None of us knows what transforming our congregations into truly multicultural expressions of our faith will be. I relish the opportunity to create something new. And this is what keeps me in the work with you. At a special meeting held by the Canadian Unitarian Council on November 27th, Canadian Unitarian Universalists voted to accept an eighth principle. It states, We, the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council, covenant to affirm and promote individual and communal action that accountably 
dismantles racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and our institutions. The vote passed by 95% majority. And I am grateful to our delegates who voted to adopt this principle, and I am so grateful to this congregation who gave them this direction. I read that piece from the Commission on Institutional Change because I think it speaks to us, the majority of us that are from the Northern Hemisphere and are part of the dominant colonizing culture of North America and this congregation, all congregations, most congregation, UU congregations. There's nothing wrong with being from Northern Europe. I am. When I did my ancestry DNA, English. That's it. Well, a little Irish and Scottish in there too. Just as there is nothing wrong with you if your heritage is from the Southern Hemisphere. You are here, I am here. We are part of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, and that's a good thing. Like Mary Byron, I have had a pretty privileged life. My parents were not wealthy. I am a farmer's daughter. But we were much wealthier than my First Nations neighbors across the street. The girls that lived on the reserve across the street from our dairy farm were my childhood friends, and I spent a lot of time with them at their house, just as they spent a lot of time with me on our farm. That was my first inkling that something was not quite right, not even. I remember going into their home and wondering, I come from prairie settler stock. My grandparents on both sides were lured to Saskatchewan on the promise of free land. I've spoken of this here before. And now, and how it was never discussed that the land we were actually on was not free nor empty, but taken and settled by Northern Europeans. I want to say that even though I focused on First Nation studies during my social work degree, I did the work to become an ab Aboriginal uh, certified Aboriginal foster parent, and I did foster many First Nations children. And I have continued learning about colonization and the culture that supported and supports colonization. I consider myself to be a beginner. I have so much to learn. And there is no shame in that. The Commission on Institutional Change, widening the circle, we're talking about circles today, asks us to look around, figure out what we're actually seeing, examine our own biases, learn, make changes, and then begin the work of looking around, figuring out what we're actually seeing, examining our biases, learning, making changes, and then we begin the process over and over and over again. We are never there, there is no there, there, it is a circle. And no matter how much we learn, how woke we think we are, we are never done. By we, I mean those of us that are centered, those of us with the power, those of us that look like the dominant culture, those of us that have benefited from being part of this culture, it is a circle. It starts with us when we decide we wish to begin the work. And we are never done with the work. The work begins when we ask the questions, why are our congregations predominantly white, middle class or upper class, educated? Basically, why do our congregations not reflect what's going on outside of our walls? This is a very complex question, and there are no easy answers, and there's no guilt, and there's no shame. It just is. And it's not because people have their own religion. It's not because immigrants stick together. It's systemic. It's the way it was. It's the way it is. It's comfortable for us, and we like it this way. I like it this way too, and I admit it. And I need to find ways to get uncomfortable, to be always centering the voices of those that are on the margins, 
to be wondering what decolonization actually looks like here. The Commission, widening the circle, asks us to do these things and so much more. It started way back when, when the previous president of the Unitarian Universalist Association resigned after a hiring controversy, and there was a big blow up, and if some of you may know about it, and it's, you can read about it. Google it. I invite you to read about it. I won't take time this morning. In the Commission, the the Commission folks talked to over a dozen, not a dozen, over a thousand Indigenous, Black, and people of color about their experience in the UU world. And it is the Indigenous, Black, and people of color that have called us to accept, to bring into being our eighth principle. In the U.S., they use the acronym BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People in Color, which has been BIPOC, but here in Canada, we realize that we need to center Indigenous folks. So we say Indigenous, Black, and people in, of color. The Commission, and again, I encourage you to read it, lets us know that congregations and individuals in our congregations don't really understand what we're doing and how we're coming across to people on the margins. People who try to break in find it hard to break through the barriers to full inclusion in our congregations. We don't mean to do it, we just do it. Most congregations have a way of doing things that are pretty set in stone and aren't about to change anything anytime soon. Thank you very much. That doesn't make anyone bad. It just means we need to decide we are going to move into the circle. If you think about those um, death-defying things in playgrounds we used to have when I was a kid and you got on them and they went around and somebody pushed and there was a little there was a thing and you and then kids kind of flew off so I I like to think about this circle that I'm talking about as one of those death defying playground equipment things you get on it and you move through and you're changed and you stay on and you get off for a little while because that's enough and then you get back on. So, we need to decide we're gonna move into the circle. We look around, we figure out what we're actually seeing. We examine our own biases. We learn and study. We make changes and then begin the work of looking around, figuring out what we're actually seeing, examining our biases, learning, making changes, and then begin the process over and over and over again. We can't do this work alone either. We can't make that thing go around without somebody's dad or parent pushing. And the kids that are scared have to go into the middle where they're, they won't fly off. I need help interpreting what I'm seeing, so I can't do it alone. And no one is better at this than anyone else. But some have been working longer, so already have made some mistakes and experienced the embarrassment that goes along with the, with the mistakes. Making mistakes is inevitable. And the Commission suggests that this is the number one reason we decide to stay in our, con in our comfort zones and not begin. It's embarrassing to use the wrong gender pronoun or use binary language when we know better. I did that with Erica yesterday on the phone and I was kind of embarrassed. I was like, oh, come on, I know better. She was very gracious, didn't even mention it. And sometimes we'll ask a person with brown skin where they're from. No, where, where are you really from? Can I feel your hair? Oof. Don't ever say that. The commission was developed in the United States and therefore has a leaning toward decolonization when it comes to slavery and people from Central America. Canada also has a very long and complex history with slavery. However, our work really focuses on First Nations issues along with immigration and poverty issues. 
To that end, Canadian UU leaders have looked at the Commission and created a learning opportunity for us to think about widening the circle means for Canadian UUs. They offered a course for all of us to take, and it has been widely advertised. Who has seen the advertisement for it? It's been in the weekly e-blasts and the newsletter and things. Oksana and I will be taking the course. And it's a train the trainer type of course. And this, so we're gonna take the course and then we're gonna bring it back to the congregation. And that's where you all fit in. And this is where we begin. Oksana and I will be putting on classes to help us learn how to look around, figure out what we're seeing, help us to examine our own biases, make some changes, learn some more, more, and then begin the work of looking around, <laughs> figuring out what we're actually seeing, in what's next, examining our biases, learning, making changes, and we begin again. We have to educate ourselves before we can do anything else. Otherwise, we will simply cause harm. This is going to make you uncomfortable. We actually don't know enough as a congregation to begin to partner with other organizations yet. Simply put, the chances of being offensive and doing harm are pretty high. Even after all I've learned, and I really have tried to become aware, I don't know enough. And I will never know enough, so this is not a put down. We need to acknowledge that our first step is educating ourselves so that we can see that which is hidden from us, one little thing at a time. Okay, okay, you say, Reverend Rosemary, you ask, um, how do we read the Commission on Institutional Change? Where do we start? What do we do? Well, first of all, you can buy the Commission on Institutional Change, widening the circle from Amazon. There's also a free PDF online. Just Google widening the circle of concern and it comes up. And I'll put a link to the PDF in next Friday's email as well. Next, begin to read what you can about our culture, the water we swim in, and how it has benefited the colonizing population. When I was in the United States, I suggested to people they start with white fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism by Robin DiAngelo. And remember there was slavery in Canada too. And we were very discriminatory towards all those that came into Canada on the Underground Railway. We're very proud of the Underground Railway. There are things we shouldn't be proud of. Then, if you haven't read The Inconvenient Indian, A Curious Account of Native People in North America by Thomas King, I suggest you read that. And maybe, just an idea that came out of the top of my head, and sometimes my ideas aren't well thought out, and sometimes they are. It's always a risk to say the well, not well thought ideas from the pulpit. But maybe of, some of us could uh, read Five Little Indians by Michelle Good and get together and discuss it, kind of like a book group. Maybe it'll be the first in a series. Then, after Oksana and I are trained on the commission, Canadian edition, we will put on classes here, and I certainly hope that many of us can learn together. When we're all hepped up, we were talking about this morning, when we get finished with taking the class, they're train the trainer type classes, so we're going to be taught how to teach the program, right? So we're thinking that maybe we'll do a one-day workshop just as an intro, and then we'll start the classes in September. In our work together and in the startup workshops, there was great interest in doing adult religious education. This is where we'll begin. And I hope that you will decide to get involved in this circle of concern. We are going to widen the circle. 
and we don't know just how yet. First, what am I going to say? First, we look around, figure out what we're actually seeing, learn to examine our own biases, educate ourselves, make changes, and start over. We will never be finished with the work, and as my, Mary Byron from, her, from the reading said, every time I make a new discovery about my thinking that releases limiting thoughts and behavior, I feel more free. And that is also spiritual work. I also do this work because I find such joy in the community of people engaged here. The work of dismantling systemic racism and decolonization is personal work, painstaking work, painful work, beautiful work, joyful and freeing work. And we are going to do it together. And we're going to do it carefully. And we're going to start with ourselves. Because this is where the transformation happens. From the quote at the beginning by Mary Byron, the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore speaks of dreaming a Unitarian Universalism that does not yet exist. None of us knows what transforming our Unitarian Universalist congregations will be like as they become truly multiple, multicultural expressions of our faith. I pray that we decide we wish to be in this together. May we not shy away from being honest, authentic, and clear. And may the fruits of our labor be joy, freedom, and delight. So may it be. Amen. Blessed be. Let you take a breath, and then we'll sing, come and go with me to this land. And I hope you decide, you wish to begin the work with me. Amen. Oh, that's Ham 1018, yes. Oh, it's new again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's new, but it's really fun. So I'm just going to give you two hints to make it easier. One, just relax into it because it's got just kind of a groove that you'll catch on to, so that's okay. The other one is that the very first go, come and go, there's two notes on go. And if you get that right, you'll get the timing. So I'll play it through once. We'll figure it out.
ask you to turn, extinguish the chalice. If I can find where I am, that'd be good. Thank you, Erica. You won't be alone. We'll be side by side with, an, with one another, with people yet to come, with partners we have yet to meet, creating ever-widening, perfectly imperfect, perfectly imperfect, precisely imprecise, circles and ovals and oblong things of beauty as we practice sacred flexibility, welcoming love and healing pain and demanding justice and saving lives go forth and make some new shapes. And I invite you to not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things break and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally, love extravagantly, and love unconditionally. The broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in all of you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And now I invite you to sing our final song together, Carry the Flame. Most of the time we kind of make a circle, pretend to touch, and we don't. <laughs> 